But for week one of Stronger, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be what does it mean to be stronger? Right, because does it mean stronger than yesterday? Does it mean stronger than our rude co-workers? What kind of strength are we talking about? For me, I find myself standing in the kitchen. And it's just me. It's just me and my thoughts. And I'm like, do I choose Bluebell? And I'm like, no, be stronger. I used to wear a What Would Jesus Do bracelet, but it really it meant What Would Jackie Do because of the mm. J. And then I'm like, I'm not going to go, go with Bluebell. I'm going to go with Ben and Jerry's. right. Right. Stronger. For me, I have to be stronger than gluten because, you know, when he's making all the gluten-free jokes, he's really criticizing his own wife I'm not, from the platform. Can you believe this? It's the gluten-free products. Yes. They're rough. They're Feel for me. It's like cardboard. It melts like oh. cheese. I don't know what it is. So sad. It's easy to see, though, and I think we can all unanimously agree, it's easy to see outward strength. Like, you can tell when someone is disciplined to working out, yeah. and we, we can see outward strength. Because we think of the obvious muscles, yes. right? When we think of strength, we think of the obvious. We think of muscles. I think of my friend Dwayne. You think of Dwayne? Yeah, Dwayne. You mean this Dwayne? Yes. That's the Dwayne we think of. <laughs> I think of Dwayne. All right, give the people what they want, Dwayne. <laughs> okay. This guy's that, got the eye of the, the tiger. One. That's the one. All right. <laughs> Right, Nobody is enough. going to question the strength of this man right here because this is what we think of. Look, yeah. Dwayne and I are actually going to be, he's going to be my stunt double in a new movie. Oh. It's not called The Fast and the Furious. <laughs> it's called The Faith and the Curious. It's, it's going to oh. not be in any theaters. I actually beat him in arm wrestling two weeks no, ago. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You did not. Because that is a different level of discipline altogether, right? And nobody's questioning, like, that he's strong, right? Nobody's questioning that in the natural he's strong. But we're not going to talk about that type of strength this weekend. Right. We're going to talk about a different kind of strength. Because in this series, in our Stronger series, we know that every day carries its challenges, yes. right? But it also provides us with an opportunity to become stronger in Jesus. And that's what we're talking about in this series. We're talking yes. about being stronger in Jesus. And we're a foundation bible based church, so you're going to pick up a lot of scripture, and we encourage you to take down notes. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 says it this way, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I love that we're in the month of May, like, uh, gotta be May. Gotta be May. All right, anyways, do not be dismayed. Sorry, it's going to be all day. For I'm your God, I will strengthen you and help you, and I love this last part, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When we lean into his presence, yeah. we actually are relying on the strength from God to us and through us. Yeah. It's, it's a great verse. And I love this scripture because it's actually a prophetic encouragement from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, to the nation of Israel. And in this encouragement, you have to know where they were in this time. This was a, a declaration of God's faithfulness because in this period of time, they were facing exile and defeat. And it was his promise promise to help yeah. them. It was his promise. And it's important to note in this particular passage that there was reason for concern, y'all. There was reason in this place that he was saying, fear not, yeah. because they had reason. They were actually facing something. Has anybody ever faced something before? How anybody are, ever? How many of y'all are currently facing something? Like, right. let's be honest, you're in the middle of something. Right. And Isaiah was saying from the heart of God, he was saying to them, hey, hey, don't let worry yes. overtake you. Even though you see something in front of you, don't be consumed by worry. And, and, and God was literally conveying it to Isaiah and through him saying, listen, yeah. I'm going to help you. I'm going to literally reach down into your situation. We all want to be delivered from the fire. Right. Like that just makes things easier. But sometimes God plucks us up out of the fire. Right. And then the beautiful thing about that story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was they were in the fire. They had to walk through it. Again, how many of y'all have gone through some things? Come on. Because if God brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. through it. And the beautiful thing about that story was they, they didn't smell like smoke. Their clothes weren't burned up. So God is literally telling him, hey, you're in the middle of this because we all experience moments of defeat. We all experience what feels like exile. We all go through broken moments. We all have wounds of many kinds. Some look like scars. Some we're still trying to put band-aids over areas we need stitches. Yeah. But how do we get stronger? And this is what we're going to 
unpack today. This is what we're going to unpack today. How do we get stronger in the midst of life's painful moments? Yeah, I think that we have to first ask ourselves the question when we're talking about getting stronger. Because when we walk through these things in life, when we walk through these darker times, anybody ever found yourself where you're like, I wish I'd responded differently. I wish that yeah. faith had been my first response. I yeah. wish that I didn't get so consumed so quickly. And we find ourselves saying, okay, the next time I face this, I'm gonna be stronger. But I think the thing that we have to ask ourselves first is if we recognize Recognize that Jesus came, his whole entire purpose was to come to offer us help. If we recognize that, then why do we consider help to be such an ugly word? Wow. Think about it. Because if we know. Because help feels like it makes me look weak. Yeah. But if we know that Jesus came to bring us help, why do we look at help like it is something so shameful? But how many of you know that we do overall? If you know that you need help, oh, I must be weak. If they really need help, oh, they're really, really weak. They haven't gotten it figured out yet. Why do we do this when we know we were going to need a savior? That was the purpose. And we have to recognize that people are struggling everywhere. Everywhere. There is a great struggle happening in our nation at the current time. It is easy to dig our heads in the sand and say, well, 20 years ago, this was the way things were. We don't live 20 years ago. And the enemy is crafty. I was talking to a gentleman out in the lobby during the Freedom Encounter, and he was telling me some stuff he was walking through, and I said, hey, man, look at me real quick. This is what the enemy does. He's crafty. He has his tricks and his schemes and his patterns, and this is what he's trying to tell you. Sure, the only one dealing with this. And he goes, you're right. I said, but let me, I've got great news for you. You're not the only one dealing with this. You're not the only one struggling in these areas. That's why we need help. That's why we need help. So can we talk about it for just a moment? Can we talk about some realities that our nation is facing? Because as of 2020, suicide is literally the second leading cause of death in American children ages 10 to 14. Wow. That's a heavy one, right? Sobering. But it's a reality we should be aware of, right? That is the second leading cause, only second to accidental death. That is only what it's second to. And because of the mayhem that ensued in that year of 2020, depression is up 28% across the nation. Anxiety is up 25%. There are over 40 million adults that are affected every year by anxiety. Some studies show over 42 million and 25 million adults struggle with ongoing depression. These are real statistics, the reality of where people currently are. So for us to still look back at that word help like it's ugly, we have to evaluate ourselves and see where are we in the midst of this. So um, you're brilliant. Um, You have your master's degree in counseling. I'm married. I'm married. I'm married all the way up. (laughs) Top shelf here, folks. Um, And my family dealt with so many addictive issues. And when we were talking, you you said, man, 93.5% of adults with substance abuse struggles, which is where my family came from, uh, they're not actively seeking help. And they didn't get, 93.5% didn't get any help in 2022. So they're dragging the residue of year after year after year and this estimated number of adults in the U.S. that had serious suicidal thoughts, like thoughts that uh, people would be better off if I was no longer here, is around 12 million people. Now, we say this not to just talk at you. Maybe you struggle with this. Maybe you're watching online and you're like, yeah, I can actually fit myself into some of these categories. The Israelites in Isaiah chapter 41 We're not the only ones facing defeat and despair. These are the facts. We wrestle with things, and we deal with things every single day. But thank God we have the help of the helper. Thank God we have a Savior who loves us and not only loves us, but actually chooses us. It's massive. And we share this, not to put a wet blanket over over our day. Because we're getting stronger, y'all. But the fact is that pretending doesn't fix anything. Amen? 
It doesn't strengthen us. So when we're talking about how do I get stronger, just pretending like there is not something great that we are facing as the body of Mm -hmm. Christ and as a nation, that's not the way to to fix it. Because Jesus did not go to the cross so that we would get good at pretending, right? That's good. He did it so that we would be transformed. He went to the cross so that, yes, these realities will still exist in the world in which we live, but he did it so that we would be transformed because of him, so that we could find hope in him. And I don't know about you, but hope is really significant for me. Yeah. He's, he's told the story before about um, the first time I really experienced the hope of God. And I remember it so specifically. Uh, I don't have a, a ton of, of really clear memories from my childhood. But I remember being little and I remember laying in my bed at night and there wasn't anything in specific that I had done. There wasn't anything that I really understood about it, but I knew in that moment I was scared and I asked God to help me. And I laid there in my bed as a little girl, scared, and I literally felt the pain, and I, and I mean this with all sincerity, I was a kid, so the only way I can describe it is how it marked me. I felt the peace of God wow. lay on me like a weighted blanket. And I went to sleep that night feeling hopeful. Wow. All I did was said one prayer, God, help me. I'm scared. Yeah. And I felt the peace of God. And maybe you felt that before. Um, the end of every service, I love, we, we speak the benediction. Bible theologians believe it's the greatest blessing in the Bible. Number six, verses 24 through 26. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. I love this part. Turn his countenance towards you. He saw you as a little girl. And you had his heart and his attention. And he turned his countenance towards you. I need somebody to hear that. Yeah. He's not overlooking you. But this is the last part. And may he give you peace. Bible theologians will say that may he give you peace is literally in the midst of chaos. He has the incredible ability because he is God. All powerful, all knowing. He has the ability to overshadow you or wrap you up like a blanket. How many of y'all have experienced that type of peace before? Where he just wrapped you up and in the midst of everything feeling like it was falling apart, you're like, but, but I still have my peace. Somebody needs to declare today that my peace is non-negotiable. Come on, how many of y'all... Don't let people mess with your peace. Don't let your circumstance mess with your peace. If your money's funny, don't let it mess with your peace. Hope leads... To transformation. It does. But it begins with truth. It does. Hope, le- it, it, it leads to transformation, but it begins with truth. And I love the honesty and the vulnerability of David in Psalms 142. You were talking about pretending. I've said this for years. God can't heal, fix, restore, or show up and fight for somebody that you pretend to be. Like he wants to, <laughs> and, and the truth is God's looking for you. He's like, I don't know where she's at. She put too many filters on Instagram. Oh, there she is. Like, <laughs> Come on. And society, society will say, well, brother, brother, fake it till you make it. But God can't fix, heal, or restore who you pretend to be. It's time to take off the mask. Elbow the person next to you and say, be real. Come on, be real. Begins with truth. I love the vulnerability of David. We're going to pick this up in Psalms 142, verses 1 through 7. It'll be on the screens. He said, I cry out loud to the Lord. I plead out loud to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. Watch this. David realized because of sonship, the man in the Bible who is called a man after his heart, he knew that God could handle his frustration. God can handle your frustration. He made you. He knows you're short-fused. Okay. He says, I pour out my complaint before him. I reveal my trouble to him. Although my spirit is weak within me, you know my way. Along this path, I travel. They have, hid, they have a hidden trap for me. Look to the right and see. No one stands up for me. I mean, this is like Debbie Downer. I'm in a low place. There is no refuge for me. No one cares about me. How many of y'all have ever prayed these prayers? Come on. Well, you're in good company because David prayed these prayers. But then he says, I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my shelter. You are my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am very weak. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Free me from the prison so that I may praise your name. And here's where it shifts. He said, the righteous will gather around me 
because you deal generously with me. He knew in the midst of a low place, God was going to fight for him. How many of y'all are grateful for a God who is fighting for you? This is a man, David's a man who God chose to become king over all of Israel. He was the only man, again, considered a man after God's heart. And we can all unanimously agree, and if you're a student of the Bible, we all know David had some issues. David had some struggles, yet God said, this is a man after my heart. He had great favor, but we found, we found as we read that he found himself hiding in a cave, pleading for mercy, worn out, weak, trapped, abandoned, and what felt like outnumbered. And the truth is, we can all, maybe not in the same way, like we're not hiding out in a cave in hill country, but maybe you feel worn out. Yeah. Maybe this weekend, as we kick off week one of Stronger, you feel weak. Maybe you feel a little trapped or hidden. Maybe you feel abandoned. But the shift happened with David at the end. He had confident hope in God. And that's what we want you to feel today, is that we can have confident hope in God. Come on, somebody give God okay. praise. And if you've never looked at that passage of Scripture, I want you to look back at it. Because we find hope when we ask for help. David knew. The word describes David as a man after the heart of God because he knew God's heart for him. And his heart was connected to God. Didn't mean he didn't make mistakes along the way. He did. But God still trusted him. And I think a lot of it has to do with this passage right here. Because he said, he laid it out there before God. He said, this is where I am. This is how I feel. This is what I'm dealing with. This is what it seems like. But, but I am confident in my hope, my hope. in you. Yes. And he was able to find his hope again when he asked for help. I always encourage people, it's okay how you feel. It's okay. So if you do what you can do to get that out, meaning if you can write it down in a journal, if you have somebody that you can confidently trust in a moment, but you always need to end with what the promises of God That's are good. for you. That's great. Because if you do not end on what God is giving you to find hope in, you will end on being downcast. You will end on the pain and the suffering and the struggle that you're in the midst of. He found hope when he asked for help. We have to reveal in order to heal. We have to reveal. That's a good word right there. John 16 verse 24 says, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. I love that. Ask and you will receive, but there's a following part to that. God doesn't want us to stay in that low place. He wants our joy to be fully filled up in him. We ask so that he'll fill our joy so that he'll heal, so that he will reveal what is needed in that place. Help brings joy. But in order to get stronger on the inside, in order to receive the transformation of hope that God has for us, in order to receive the help that we all long for at times, we have to make some what we call mental switches. Yeah, mental We've got to make some intentional yeah. choices yeah. to change our minds in some areas. Flip Elbow your switch. neighbor and say, we got to change our minds. We have to change our minds. Because how many of you know that our thought life, we get to choose it. We get to choose what we think about because you might have a thought pop in your head and you can decide if that thought remains or if that thought must go. And that's why it's so important to take captive, that's what the word yeah. says, every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yeah. Man, you're going to be broke as a joke. We have to start doubting our doubts. So if the enemy's going to try to bring doubt, start doubting your doubts. You're going to be broke as a joke like your family. I doubt that. You're always going to struggle. You're not going to graduate college. I doubt that. Yep. Stop putting it back on the enemy that I am an overcomer. I'm, a, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. And I'll take captive every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Yeah. And reroute those frustrations Good. to the Lord. All right, so switch number one. Write this down in your notes. Society aims to program us, but the word should be training us. That's great. Society would love to program our thinking and the way that our life functions, but we should be trained by the Word of yes. God every single day of our lives. That is so good. Romans chapter 12 actually 
paints this picture in verse two. It says, don't copy the behaviors, that's key, and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person yeah. by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And if you want to know what God's will is for you, look right there. It's good. It's pleasing. pleasing. It's perfect. He has good things for you. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we buy into the lie that, ah, oh, it's always going to be like this. But no, the word says that the will of God for you is good. It's so great. pleasing. It's perfect. Psalms 119. I'm going to give you a few scriptures here. Verses 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It doesn't say your word is a lamp unto my feet if my life is perfect. Your word is a lamp. No, no, he's meeting us where we're at as his sons and daughters. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 says, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, we don't like that word, correcting, we don't like that word, and training in righteousness. Society is aiming to program us to think, accept, allow certain things in, but we have to allow the word of God to train us to a posture of righteousness. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So good, so good. The Word was God. Yes. The Word has always been. John 17.17 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Yeah. Your word is truth. Truth has always been truth, will always be truth. In the beginning, the word was God, the word was with God, and the word is always going to be God. So we always can know what truth is because we know where to find it, right? We always know, no matter how much confusion spreads in this world, truth will remain forever. Yep. So where there is confusion, we take it to the word. Take it to the word. And we check the facts. Because if it does not line up with the word of God, then it is either a lie or it's deception. But either way, it's not of God. That's good. If you cannot find it in the word of God, then it is not a principle or a practice that we live by or allow into our lives. Because it is not from the truth of God's word. What's interesting, I've, I've shared this before, um, but when the... Uh, the Federal Trade, um, I think it's the Trade Commission or probably not, uh, the Reserves. Yeah, 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 Federal Reserve. They, uh, they, want their, uh, they want their counterfeit teams to, to learn how to spot a lie. Um, it's funny, statistically, they did a poll and they said, what do you think those folks are studying hours and hours a day? Do you think they're studying a real $100 bill, a real $20 bill, or do you think they're studying the counterfeit? Statistically, people said, well, the counterfeit. They need to know the weight of the paper. They need to see the ink. They need, they need to smell it. They need to know. Some of y'all are like, I know a real $100 bill and something fake. No, they, they have them study the real thing hours a day so that they can spot the lie from the truth. This is the thing about being in the Word, being a student of the Word, reading every page of the Bible and learning and absorbing the truth so when society says, this is what you need to choose, this is what you need to believe, this is what you need to accept, this is what you need to allow, you say, well, let me take it back to what the Word of God says. So then you're allow, you, you see, I'm not going to allow that in because I can spot a lie of the enemy real quick. The trick in, the, in Genesis with Eve wasn't that the serpent lied to her. That's the misconception. Well, he lied to her. No, he deceived her. Because if he would have said, God never talked to you, God never talked to any of you. Y'all, you, this, this is AI. This is not the real God. No, no, he, he deceived her by saying, did, but did God really say that? Did God really say not to eat from that tree? Oh, he just doesn't want you to see what he sees, feel what he feels, know what he knows. The enemy will always come in with deception to try to throw you off the course. I said this a couple months ago that we're all getting comfortable around tables that Jesus would want to flip over because we're no longer recognizing what is the truth. Somebody should say amen. I feel, I feel the spirit of God on that one. Because when we base our lives daily on fact, not fiction, you will feel stronger, more stable every day. 
When you are confident what truth is every day, it doesn't matter what kind of counterfeit you see because you know what truth is and you know where you're going. You know what your day holds. You know the purpose that God is calling you to in that moment. Yes. And you're unshaken by the stuff around us. It's still going to be there. Yes. And then you know who you are and and whose you are. You know, I, I shared this last week. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the book of Peter talks about how you're chosen by God. Chosen. Chosen by God. Like, not overlooked or third round pick. Like, he chose you. In Genesis 127, it says that he literally shaped and molded you in his image. That's why we love diversity so much here. Because we're intentional about diversity because without diversity, you're missing out on pieces of the image of God. So we look around this room and we're like, oh, she knows who she is. He knows who he is. And y'all, we're gonna get stronger every single day when you know who you are. I said it a moment ago, above and not beneath. When you walk into a room, you walk in with confidence. Why is she so bold? Because she's a king's kid. Why is he so confident? Because he knows who he is and whose he is. Come on, how many of y'all know who you are? Come on. And if you don't, we're going to break it down this series. And you've heard us say it lots and lots of times, but people don't get to define who we are. We don't even get to define who we are. It was placed inside of us by our creator. Yep. And when we come to understand him and understand yep. who, he, who he says we are, then we have a confidence in knowing, yeah, this is me. Yep. Because it's based in the word. It's based in what God defined to be who I am, who he placed in my life. And what, knowing that, what does the word say that we have every day? We have victory in Jesus. That's where our victory comes from. It comes from Jesus. And that brings us to our switch number two. Switch number two is that self-focus limits us, but Christ-mindedness empowers us. I want to step on some toes. Self. It's good. Focus. Self awareness is really good. Mm -hmm. Our point number one: we're talking about how help is a good thing. Asking for help is good. Self awareness is good, but being self consumed is the enemy's favorite thing. It's his favorite place to mess with us. True. He will use any tactic he can to keep our focus inward and on ourselves. We should be aware of what we're dealing with so that we can ask for help. But if we do not see that everybody else around us is also dealing with things, then we will become so lost in our own pain that we cannot see God can still use you in a broken place to help somebody else in a broken place. That's good. And I've used this example before. I held up a mirror. I said, it's really, really difficult when you're consumed by me, myself, and I. That trap is real. And you're constantly holding up a mirror. I can't see. I can't see the three rows in front of me here because I'm too consumed by. <laughs> Let me get my angle. <laughs> now, but we're here. We're so self-focused, so self-consumed. That what if God, in the midst of your journey, your process of healing and preparation, and preparation, what if, what if God wants you to get in the way of someone else's storm and say, "Hey, let me encourage you. I'm a work in progress myself, but God sees me, and if He sees me, I'm telling you, He sees you, and He'll fight for you, and He'll restore you, and He can show up and be with you." It's good. Proverbs 18:1 says, "Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire." Wow. And how many of you know that in some of the lowest places, that is what is on repeat in our minds, is just to pull away, to pull ourselves back. But the word says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire because we are only thinking about ourselves in that spot. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Wow. Isaiah 26, verse 3, one of my favorite scriptures, it says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he trusts in you. Because he trusts in you. We have to focus on Jesus, y'all. That is where our strength lies. We have our victory in Jesus. And it's, don't get it twisted. It's good to, you know, take care of yourself. Some of you are like, I do like facials. (laughs) But being self-consumed, it literally changes the trajectory of how Jesus modeled things for us and how he wants us to live out our lives. I talk about ambition all the time in leadership teachings that ambition is a really good thing until it becomes unhealthy ambition. 
and you start putting all the attention on yourself and you take your eyes off of Jesus. At the end of the Freedom Encounter last night, I talked about how Peter stepped out of the boat, was the only other man documented in the Bible to ever walk on the water and he was able to walk on the water until he took his eyes off of Jesus. He, he put his eyes on the storm, put his eyes on his own insecurities, his, his own issues. So we have to be very, very careful to redirect those things to the Lord. Philippians, if you're new to the Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. See, when we put our eyes, we fix our mind on the thoughts of God, and then we surround ourselves with those that are around us, this whole iron sharpening iron thing is real, and what it does is it takes the attention off of you, okay? So mental switch number three, I love this one. You've got this only because God's got you. Yeah. You've got that. I've got this only because God has you. You don't have this because of any great victory that you've secured, right. but because you've realized, we've all realized, maybe today's the day you realize that you need a savior, That's right. a father, a helper like David needed. We all need Jesus every day. The answer begins with and ends with Jesus, and he will be the one that renews our strength. That's right. We need the help of the helper. We need daily strength to be renewed. Yes. We need wisdom to reach out when we need help. But we also should be asking people how they truly are. We should be asking, how are you doing, and mean it. We should be praying in the moment, y'all, a lot more often. When we recognize a need, we have a tendency to say, I'll pray for you and go on about our business. And then how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but actually pray later. We should be praying in the moment. We should be a people that pray. So good. We should be a people that pause what we're doing and pray and ask God for help. Because it's really easy to just send somebody a text with praying hands emojis. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm going through a lot right now. Oof. Glad I'm not going through that. Ugh, maybe I'll pray for you. Praying hands emojis. I got off the phone the other night, and she said, hey, who are you talking to? And I told her, and she said, did you, did you pray for him when you got off the phone? I said, I did. And she said, call him back. This really felt like you were supposed to pray with him. And the crazy thing is, I'm just being all humanity here, just being transparent. Right before I got off the phone with him, I felt like I should pray for him. But I got off the phone, and I thought, ah, I'll just send him some emoji hands. Like... <laughs> And she says, you should call him back. I called him back and prayed for him. He said, man, I really, I really needed that. Thank you for calling me back. And I said, it was my, it was my idea. Amen. He did. he did say that. No jokes. But we also, we also can't be waiting for somebody else to ask us so true. how we are. We have to be willing to acknowledge it first, just like David did. Uh -huh. Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. How many of you know that sometimes the situation isn't fixed, but just that peace like a blanket that I knew as a kid is enough of a fix for us in the midst of a trouble to know yep. that God so has this. Yes, We've got this because God's God. got this. Yes. I don't know the solution. I don't know the end result. I don't know how it's going to work out. But I know that God's got this. So I know that all will be well. Because it is not, it is not weakness to have difficult moments, y'all. It's humanity. It's, it's our humanness. Yes. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. That doesn't say come to me if you ever get to a spot where you get heavy and heavy hearted. No, it says come to me all who are. That is an understood statement, meaning there's going to be a spot in life where you feel heavy. There's going to be a spot in life where you feel like you're laboring. And he's saying, in that moment, come to me. Come to me, because I will give you rest. I will give you the peace that you need to continue forward. I will give you what is needed. Some situations need further help. Counseling is a good, good thing. But all resolve, all strength is formed in the presence of Jesus. Yes. We have to take it to Jesus first. He will provide and reveal what you specifically need in every situation, but you have to cast it on him. 
First Love? Peter 5, 7. Yes, yes, yes. To cast our anxieties on all him. Of all of it. Because he cares for us. We have to cast it on him first. But how many of you know that casting something, that's an action? Yes, it is. It's not just let it roll off of you. No, it is pick it up and chuck it. Let go of it. Get rid of it. One of our like you found a bomb without a pin in it. You got to get that thing as far from you. Grenade. As by, same thing. You got it. You know what it meant. <laughs> you know what I meant. Cry like, for help. Go ahead. <laughs> I love at First Peter five seven. You just referenced it. The word cast. Uh, had a, we had a father in the faith said you literally know what that means, right? And he said it's not like a. He said it's the picture fishing and you're about to throw your line out that's pretty good that was Imagine, not bad I get these sounds all the that time that was actually pretty good walk down the hallway you all yeah, saw it you heard it hit the water that wasn't bad okay but he said you, you, you sling it out there you get it literally you throw it as far as you can get that mess away because God never designed you to carry it. Jesus himself in the garden of Gethsemane was, was crying out to God because he knew what was ahead. He needed God to show up in that moment. He needed a little bit of peace in that broken time. He was fully God and fully man. What he did was he went to the garden and he took it to the Father first. With your eyes closed just for a moment, maybe some of you today, there's some things in your life and I, I want to I wanna follow Jesus' example in this moment. Maybe you haven't taken your request or your struggles or those things that you have been compartmentalizing to someone else. So this is our prayer today is that you would take it to the Father first. Maybe you need help today. Maybe you need hope today. Maybe you need the Lord to show up today. And But here, here's your step. You have to reveal it in order for him to heal it because he's not a forcer. He will not just pull it out. He will not just remove it. You have to open-handedly say, God, I make room. I will make room for you right now, and I'll reveal this so that you'll heal it. And with all of your eyes closed, let me just pray for you really quickly. Lord, if, if there is anyone in this place that would say, I, I need help. I need help from the helper. I need help internally. I need help with an external situation. I need your help. I need some supernatural provision. I need some supernatural relief. In the name of Jesus today, I pray for great peace to just flood you and cover you right where you sit. I ask for the peace of God that passes all of our understanding to remind you in this moment that God's got you covered. You are covered. You are covered on every side. And he will reveal to you as you seek to be closer to his heart exactly what to do next. I pray for peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Would you stand your feet for just a moment? With every eye closed just for a moment. If you're here and you would say, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Jackie, here's the reality. Uh, I haven't asked for help. I actually need some hope. And I need some joy. I, I need peace in my life. And with every eye closed, the reason we do all of this, the reason we gather weekly across all of our locations and people by the thousands watch and watch parties and house parties around the nation is because we're all longing for a Savior. Maybe you know the Lord. Maybe you walk with Him. And maybe this was a great reminder of how to be stronger. But maybe you're also here and you would say, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but today is the day I want to give my life to him. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, and we don't pray prayers just to pray them. It's not a ritual here at Hope City. We pray according to the word in Romans 10 that says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. So maybe you're the first invitation. You want to give your life to Jesus for the very first time. Maybe you're the second invitation. You say, Daniel, Jackie, I want to get stronger, but the truth is I found myself in a pit. I found myself in a ditch. I found myself choosing myself. I've been self-consumed and I've gotten caught up in the prodigal life and today's the day I want to rededicate my life. I need internal strength again and I know that it's found 
in the arms of Jesus. Whether you're the first invitation for the first time salvation, you're the second invitation for rededication, I'm going to count to three. And at Woodlands, at Katie, watching online right now, you can say yes to Jesus and our team will help you here at West Houston. One, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I want to get stronger. I want to rededicate my life to him. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over the room. I see you. One, two, three, four, five. I see you. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I see you. Come on. Let's give God praise. I saw you, my friend. I see you all on the way in the back. It's a good day. Can everybody pray this prayer with us? Say, Jesus, it's me. From today on, I'm choosing to live for you. I need all my strength from you. Thank you for hanging on the cross for me. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it because you said I was worth it. I confess all of my sins, all my struggles, all my selfishness, all my selfish ambition. I surrender it all and I ask for your forgiveness because in you, I breathe. In you, I move. In you, I have my being. So I choose you as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give God praise?